like to offer uh, some brief and tentative observations of a concept that has been used by just one speaker in the discussion this afternoon, and that is the concept of capitalism. Um, a famous uh, 19th century also um, has uh, described a developmental tendency within capitalism, namely that the character of production becomes ever more social uh, or gesellschaftlich in the origin, original um, uh, formulation. What does that mean? Uh, I think uh, uh, very briefly um, that uh, uh, the two dimensions are important uh, here. Uh, chains, chains of value creation become ever longer. An example, many people believe that uh, Audi is a German car. That's wrong, uh, because uh, the component parts of an Audi car are manufactured in 15 countries. Um, value creation uh, is, is, has become systemic. Uh, the term of network is uh, rightly uh, applied. Uh, in order to make a car, you do not only depend on these uh, countries in space, but also you depend on means of transportation, of communication, of finance, of courts, training, pension systems, and so on. They all interact and contribute to the creation of a car. Um, the capitalist economic system is a collective uh, process. This is one dimension. The other dimension is, that is very dear to uh, uh, Philippe in some of his writings, is the uh, historical uh, dimension. Our benefits, our prosperity depends upon the civilizational accomplishments of many generations in the past. There is a free lunch, namely that, that we have inherited. We stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, as someone has uh, put it. And both of these trends, the interconnectedness, interdependence, the network nature, the systemic nature, and the civilizational cognitive legacies that we benefit from um, and make it impossible to attribute the outcome to individual effort. We live in an objectively post-individualist economy. We rely on a collective inheritance of uh, legal institutions, of knowledge, um, and so on. And our wealth is a collectively generated and uh, historically based uh, wealth. But the same applies to the damages that the system does. The system does not just generate wealth, it also generates massive damages, not just to the environment, but also social damages in the form of precariousness, insecurity, unemployment, poverty. The year of birth is a major determinant of uh, the uh, uh, lifetime income. The year in which you uh, enter the labor market depends entirely on whether you are in a, a, a depression or a recession or whether you are in a boom uh, period. This is entirely lack uh, made up of uh, collective processes. Um, and uh, today we see that uh, in 2005 the European Union, the statistical office, invented the term, the, the category, statistical category of NEET, N-E-E-T. That means people who are not in education, employment, or training. And these people, are more than 30% of their age group 
in no less than five countries. Is it their fault? No, it is luck or it is a collective effect. Um, as uh, to generalize very roughly, uh, the, the dynamic of the labor market is such that the supply of labor goes up. One statistic is that uh, since 1990, that is in the last less than one generation, the effective labor supply on a global scale has doubled. And that means farm to factory, that means uh, a female labor market participation, and many other things. But while at the same time, the demand for labor is decreasing, um, and uh, that is due to technology, uh, and it is also due to something that is now in the center of macroeconomic reasoning, namely secular stagnation. Economic growth may well be a matter of the past that is not to be expected for the future. All this cannot be attributed to individual behavior, individual work efforts, individual virtues, the work ethic, and so on. It is an objective process that uh, cannot be controlled through uh, individual uh, efforts. And uh, uh, economic individualism is an obsolete ideology, uh, although it's a very attractive uh, uh, ideology because it allows for the self ascription of economic success. My wealth is my uh, reward, well deserved reward, whereas in fact it is often based and increasingly based on inherited, not on earned uh, uh, property. And it's also an attractive ideology because. Uh, you can blame the victims uh, and uh, attribute uh, the losers uh, uh, to their wrong or mistaken or unethical behavior. And uh, the principal guideline of labor market policy in our uh, type of capitalist systems is to maximize employability in spite of all uh, the uh, conditions that I have uh, mentioned. Uh, maximize employability in order to strengthen the economic individualist ideology that if you only work hard and study uh, hard, uh, then you will succeed <coughs> otherwise you will not, and the employability activation uh, complex that we have now uh, seen uh, 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 performed by social democratic parties in our countries is uh, obsolete. It does not lead to the effect that people in the secondary labor market will make a transition to the primary labor market. 1.5% of those who are two years or longer unemployed will ever make it into the 1.5% German data uh, into the primary uh, labor market. That's not their fault. But the individual, individualist ideology uh, attributes it to their fault or mis misbehavior and, and so on. But the bottom line for me is if capitalism has increased in its social character, it is an ob objective, objectively collectivist process, then the distribution of uh, income should also be a collective process that address, means address citizens rather than workers. A part of the income that is being allocated, distributed, uh, is not earned income. It must be income based upon the rights of citizens. Another question is the participation question that was so central to the 
Uh, this is my last remark. Uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, 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 to the previous uh, uh, discussion. Well, if it is uh, the case that uh, a guaranteed unconditional basic income discriminates uh, against non citizens, make it easier for non citizens to become citizens. Thank you. I was uh, very uh, enthusiastic about the idea initially. Uh, um, the idea, I, I came from, from Marxist tradition, and so the idea was that uh, you could create the sphere of liberty relative to the sphere of necessity. So, so uh, the sphere of liberty uh, uh, could, could be put in place through the basic income, allowing people to live freely in their lives uh, 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 with minimum constraints, and then the basic le the level of basic income would act in society as kind of the regulating mechanism between you know the necessity of work and then this sphere of liberty that you are trying to uh, expand very much. And then uh, Philippe had, uh, you know, Philippe and Robert van Leeuwen also had expressed sort of a very similar idea. So, so uh, how how have I uh, evolved a little bit? I, I have evolved a lot, uh, but uh, relative to 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 this issue. So so first. Uh, um, uh, People started doing evaluations. How, how, what can we do? I remember Frank van den Broek, uh, who, who was very interested in the idea, and uh, uh, when, when he was into politics, uh, he came up with numbers, and uh, 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 these numbers were not very high. And as, as a still young man at that time, I thought, that's disappointing. I want an alternative. The basic income has to be high. It has to be you know, enthusiastic, not some basic low thing, you know, because after all, we already have a, a, a social security system. Uh, 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 now, uh, in a certain sense, many of the uh, many of these uh, 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 simulations, uh, um, you know, miss something, miss something. And, and here, let me just speak a little bit as an economist. In terms of uh, net redistribution, uh, uh, giving a basic income to everybody uh, is, in a way, in net terms, the equivalent of an earned income tax credit. So simply, you implement it in a very different way, but but you know you can in terms in terms of the numbers, uh, you can make it look like a net earned income tax credit, uh, which which is a bit more advanced than a negative income tax. At that time, the the, the uh, uh, this was done at at the same time. So 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 it's possible. It would be possible to have a relatively high uh, uh, basic uh, uh, income. Uh, 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 by the way, there's, uh, I, you know, I live in Oakland and uh, we talked about pilots earlier. There's actually a pilot taking place in Oakland. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's called the Y Incubator. I mean, it's a firm that they, they're going to uh, use their money to, to fund a basic income experiment. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that further. So, so I think, I think uh, uh, an economic, from the economic point of view, it would be possible to have a relatively high uh, level maybe not 2,500 Swiss francs. Yeah, that's 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 a different story. But something I learned uh, today uh, um, is that uh, the basic income should not be too high at an early stage. And uh, this morning, Philippe de Fay had a very interesting uh, uh, talk where uh, he said, "Look, I'm interested in something that can pass politically, and for something to pass politically." Uh, uh, it can't be too high because you know you need to get the support of the trade unions of the socialists that you're not going to destroy the social security system. At the same time, you want on the conservative side, people say, "Oh, nobody's going to work. People are going to be lazy." So, so, so the the, the inter what I found interesting today is that uh, even though you cannot not use numbers, you have to use numbers. The problem is not the affordability. I think that has been said by several. It's not about the affordability. It's about the principles. It's about the ethical justification. It's about uh, having seen income as a fundamental citizen right. One uh, area where I think is also changes is that I, I had this very negative view of you know the alienating jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think I think jobs are fundamental to social integration. Jobs will continue to be fundamental for social integration. Uh, basic income should not be a substitute to job. Job creation should be something fundamental that we should be uh, uh, looking for. Uh, 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 so, so this is this is this is very important. And another uh, thing is that in this sphere of liberty, uh, um, you know, it's not obvious that all people with basic income will engage in all sorts of creative activities. That there's some utopian thinking 
about all sorts of associations. I just remember when there were free radios here, I think in the 80s, you know, that was those fantastic, the free radios. And then very quickly the market started, you know, uh, dominating this. And I think in, in many cases where new needs appear, uh, voluntary associations will try to fulfill them. Some will do them well, but they will have to compete with private firms that get created. And we see that, we see a lot of that in the, the US. Uh, now, let me just make two remarks, which I think are uh, really uh, important. One from the economic, the other from the political point of view. Uh, uh, right now, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a fad about basic income in the U.S. Silicon Valley is enamored with uh, 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 basic income, uh, uh, and, and so, so the thinking of many people in Silicon Valley said, you know, now we're creating all these robots, so very soon nobody's going to be driving a car, nobody's going to be driving a truck, you know, all the Uber people will be out of work, you know, here we're already talking about getting Uber, but they said, all the Uber people will be out of work, and, you know, so basic income, that's a solution. Just give a basic income and then, then uh, uh, that, that's uh, uh, going to be the, the solution. Uh, uh, economists have always been... Was, was that the first one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I still have two minutes. Okay, good. So, so uh, um, uh, uh, there has always been, you know, this argument that jobs will disappear. Jobs are not going to disappear. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the problem is that capitalism throughout its history has been extremely bad at providing social uh, protection. The labor markets, you know, exist and labor markets have worked, but social protection has really not been provided. And, and we've had this, this sphere of the welfare state, which, you know, was associated to a certain mode of economic development, and now that is in crisis. So, so in a way, basic income, uh, uh, it should be seen as a modernization of social protection, basing it as a citizen right. Citizen right. And so where with robots basic income can help is to the extent that there's going to be technological change, uh, uh, there could be worsening of income inequality. And this is, you know, we're already seeing the, the worsening of inequality. We're seeing the precariousness, precariousness of the jobs that are being created. So in Germany, you know, you have the Hartsphere uh, jobs, you know, what, what is that, etc. And so basic income can help sustain a sufficient income by having that, that pillar of the basic income plus the, uh, 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 um, plus the uh, labor income on top. So in another way, that's a way of creating compatibility between precariousness, so, so, so solving the problem of precariousness and flexibility. We've tried to solve the problem by saying, uh, we uh, try to fight precariousness by uh, uh, fighting against flexibility, but basic income, in a way, I think, is a better is a better trade-off. The last thing I want to say is about citizenship. It's true that we talk about participation. Uh, uh, it's true that I think the only way is to do it via citizenship, and I agree with what Klaus said that you should, you know, make the uh, uh, make the limits. Uh, uh, sort of reduce, reduce them, but it is, so the more citizen right, citizenship rights you have, the more uh, uh, it's going to be a barrier to become a citizen. And, and there I, I agree with, uh, with what has been said. I just think it's inevitable. I think, I think basic income is necessary and inevitable, but I also think that these tendencies towards dualization that are already there are still going to be. So, so I don't see basic income as a panacea. I, I see very strong possibilities of, of dualization of some parliament kirkenses of you know, 21st century. Uh, uh, but there are solutions. Uh, so, and here I think something that has not been said at all, and this is where a democracy should, you know, we should invest much more in education and health. Because education and health is really fundamental uh, 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 in terms of, of helping people uh, to get empowered. I'll finish. There seems to be a, a strong convergence between uh, what you just said and what you didn't hear, but uh, Josh said yesterday, including your common, the, the sort of pensée unique of the people coming from Berkeley against the Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I should say that uh, I didn't present uh, Gérard uh, that much, but Gérard used to be a professor at the ULB, at the Free University of Brussels, and in fact uh, I met him in the very room 
he came regularly here in Louvanana, in the room in which the collective Charles Fourier was going to meet uh, uh, later than in the following, the following year, I think, after I met you. And your contribution to the, to the conference in 86 was then uh, published in the book edited by uh, Annie, by Annie Miller uh, under the title, uh, you may with some trepidation remember the, the title, which was Why Socialism Needs Basic Income, Why Basic Income Needs Socialism. There's a before and after. Smash first, build second. Secondly, there's taming capitalism. That's the classic social democratic vision. That capitalism creates great harms, but it can be cabined within a set of democratically imposed constraints to neutralize those harms in ways that make it a less capitalistic capitalism, so to speak. Then there is resisting capitalism, which is a reactive mode to protest against the harms, uh, typically from below in the form of social movements or labor movements. And there's escaping capitalism which in some eras took the form of moving to the frontier and trying to be a subsistence producer outside of the orbit of capitalism, or to create things like worker cooperatives, which are forms of market enterprise, but which violate capitalist principles through their democratic and egalitarian organization. Those, I think, are the four dominant forms. Uh, none of them are plausible as a way of transcending capitalism. Smashing we tried in the 20th century with catastrophic consequences. It is possible to smash systems, but not to build emancipatory, democratic, and egalitarian alternatives in the rubble. Uh, tame capitalism did a pretty good job, but the tameability of capitalism seems to be weakening under the conditions of globalization and financialization, although I think it remains a key part of, uh, of our strategic repertoire. Uh, resisting, of course, is always present, but it's limited in its capacity to actually transform systems. And escaping is also always present, but typically it creates niches and enclaves uh, that are insulated from the worst effects of capitalism, but again, incapable by themselves. What I think we need is a strategic vision that combines taming, uh, taming and escaping. And that's what I think is so marvelous about basic income. It is a way of taming capitalism. It neutralizes some of its harms. That's the social justice arguments, the anti-poverty arguments, the autonomy arguments to give, pe to give people resources in spite <clears throat> of their marginalization from, the, from labor markets. But it also gives people resources to build alternatives. Uh, one way of thinking about basic income is that it's a fantastic subsidy to worker cooperatives and other innovative forms of collective organization in the social and solidarity economy. Uh, and here's an irony for you, if you like. I think uh, basic income is a way of solving the credit market problems that, that uh, workers cooperatives face. So one big problem for worker cooperatives that keeps them small is they're undercapitalized. And they have difficulty getting capital in, or in ordinary credit markets. But imagine, you know, you're an ordinary banker. You're not hostile to credit mark to small firms or to worker cooperatives. You just think they're high risk, so they're not good loans. You look at their business plan, and you see in this business plan that the basic needs of all the members of the co-op are guaranteed exogenously from the success of their firm. Suddenly, the exact same business plan looks really low risk. Because all it has to do from your risk evaluation is generate enough income to pay back the loan. It doesn't have to provide basic subsistence to its members. Basic income makes all sorts of collective organizations that are alternative to the way we do things normally in capitalism more viable. Uh, it gives advantages to small firms and disadvantages to big firms because the workers in big firms now can say no, they have an exit option. You can think of basic income as a universal strike fund, too. That's, I think that's the way to sell it to, um, to unions. To say to them, now guys, look, guys and gals, look, you have this problem. Strikes make you vulnerable. How about a basic income? So you can strike and you have your basic needs, guaranteed. It's, really make, it's a universal strike fund. Uh, it's also an activism fund. One of the problems that every activist group always faces is how do you generate income for activists to reproduce themselves? Basic income. The capacity for collective action goes up 
uh, uh, Klaus says this brilliant uh, characterization of the difference between capitalist collective action and working class collective action, that capitalists just have to get together to have a willingness to pay, workers have to have a willingness to act. Well, part of the problems with the ability to act is to have the resources to act collectively. Well, basic income provides a subsidy for that. All right, so the, my point and my, these final reflections, the basic income, I think, is a fundamentally subversive anti-capitalist project. It breaks the proletarianization of labor by re reuniting workers and people with their means of subsistence without, in and of itself, reuniting them with the means of production. It gives them the capacity to reject capitalism. It doesn't guarantee that they will collectively organize for anti-capitalist purposes, but it makes it possible in a way that under capitalist constraints it isn't. And yet it solves problems within capitalism. And that's the kind of reform you need. You need reforms that solve practical problems in the world as it is, that open up possibilities in the world that we want. Thanks. So, uh, you know, I thought, and this is probably a hallucination, I thought uh, you asked me, Philippe, to uh, make some comments about uh, universal basic income and the politics politics around it in the United States. I might have just made that up. Yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. what I'm going to talk about. Can we talk yeah. about five plus two minutes? Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do is make four sort of scattered observations, and then I'll draw some lessons. So the first observation about the uh, more than dismal, uh, incredibly disturbing state of party politics in the United States. Uh, but the, the upside of the, that dismal state, uh, Sanders, the Denmark-loving social democrat, um, interestingly has been, was asked, has been asked many times about basic income and, and has never endorsed the idea. In fact, what he, he never says no, but he always changes the subject in a very precise, it's always exactly the same. Somebody says, are you for basic income? He says, I think it's extremely important to understand that people all have a right to a basic standard of living. And then he starts talking about education and healthcare and, um, I mean, maybe if you gave him enough time, he'd say something like the Socialist Party and be more dismissive of it. I think probably he's closest to what you said today, uh, yes. But it's an interesting fact about the politics that you could, he could run as a self-declared socialist, but never say yes or no on the issue of basic income. And it's a statement about the fact that the politics has not risen up in a very public way. Second thing, on unions, which is basically, these are basically historical reflections because there really aren't many unions in the United States. One of the most creative union leaders of the past 30 years, Andy Stern, who was head of the uh, Service Employees Union and uh, left in 2010, uh, the project that he worked on for the five years after leaving the SEIU was a book recently published called Raising the Floor, which is about universal basic income. Uh, and the idea, though, of the book is that in a world where we face a jobless future, because he spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley as he was preparing to write the book, jobless future and associated with the jobless future, insufficient demand for the products created by all the automation and robotification or robotization or whatever the word is, uh, 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 universal basic income is a pretty good thing. It gives people some income and it also enables companies to sell uh, products, but it's a solution to a negative thing. It's, there's not, he doesn't present really, I think, a compelling positive argument. So that's the most that unions have to say about it is that an ex-union leader thinks that in the absence of unions, Maybe universal basic income is a good idea. One of the third point, one of the most interesting things that's happened about universal basic income recently is 
that a coalition of groups around Black Lives Matter, 60 organizations, came together and put out a programmatic statement which includes an endorsement of universal basic income. Uh, good news in a way, at least if you like universal basic income, um, I, I should qualify it though by saying they came out in favor of a lot of things. That was one of the things. <laughs> they also came out against a lot of things, uh, and there is a lot to be against. And I, I, uh, so I would, they're not the universal basic income organization, although they are in favor of it. It was an interesting fact. Um, the fourth thing I want to do is mention again a conversation that I mentioned yesterday, which was uh, a, a, an event that happened to be at my house, organized by Boston Review. And we had a presentation by uh, Sabil Rahman, who's a, a progressive legal scholar, who was talking about common carrier regulation of platform companies like Uber. Um, and in the conversation, we had Betsy Masiello, who's the Uber public policy person, brilliant woman, uh, Natalie Foster, who we talked about before, who's an organizer, and Brishan Rogers is actually Joel's uh, nephew, who's a labor, uh, Joel Rogers' nephew, labor scholar. And what happened in the conversation was, as soon as it got really interesting and people were starting to argue about precariousness, about the gig economy, and about regulation. Betsy Masiello from Uber said, universal basic income. And then everybody you know, lined up together, and they all held hands and sang kumbaya. <laughs> the argument went away. It was, the it was everybody's favorite solution. I mean, to your, you know, OK. And she's a typical Uber institution person. Or? Betsy Masiello. No, no, she's at Uber. She's, Uber, Uber, Uber. Uber. she's at Uber. She is ah, the public Uber, power. Yeah. Uber. She's a, you know, Uber. No, Uber. fantastic. She's Uber. great. Yeah, she's no. friend, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. Taking okay. over Oakland, okay. by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, what's the relevance of these four stories? Is first of all, there is not in the United States now any single organization that owns this issue. If you ask who is the organization. There's no strong, there's no organization that has said we're going to be the universal basic income organization. Secondly, there's a lot of new energy that's, but it's, pre, but and, take your pick, I don't know whether this is an and point or a but point, coming from people in the valley. So Uber is one, uh, Y Combinator, uh, the Sam Altman is funding the experiment, it's 100 people six months, as I understand the design of the experiment, in Oakland, 100 people for six months, uh, give directly. And the motives here are, I think, a, a mix. And I, just to be clear about this, I work in Silicon Valley. I, I, I'm an employee of Apple. So uh, I'm not speaking for Apple, but I know something about what happens in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's a mix of. Uh, people who are genuinely concerned about joblessness and income inequality, uh, also who have a completely, I think, perverse and profoundly misleading passion for what they call disruptive innovation, which is 95% of bullshit idea, and would love to shift attention away from debates about the negative consequences of the digital economy. And this is a nice way to do that. And then uh, another point of, so in addition to there not being a single organization, this new energy coming from Silicon Valley, I think there is not unexpectedly incredible vagueness and arguably incredible confusion about what exactly universal basic income might be in the American setting, partly because the discussion is so early and partly because there are so many different and conflicting players in the conversation, uh, including, I mean, just a, you know, fundamentally, uh, deep confusion about the relative mer merits of targeted benefits versus universality in uh, program uh, design. So the good news is, in the United States, that a mix of techno-utopians, labor, Black Lives Matter, people who are interested in low-wage, precarious uh, work, are all interested in universal basic income. But, hesitation, I don't think we have 
any idea yet whether this convergence of interest is real or uh, illusory. Now, last point, if the politics around this are going to get real, I think the most important thing is for there to be some policy entrepreneurship around this idea. There's got to be somebody, some organization that owns the issue and gets a clear idea on the table, not pay everybody, for, but something with, with some, gets it on the table with a mix of specificity and moral high-mindedness, justification, what's the ethical justification, together with, and this is what we were talking about before, I know, a sense of delight in the idea and, and I work at Apple, great design values. <laughs> And if somebody did that, I think it would really, really be good for the country.